Years ago, I was watching either the History Channel or Discovery Channel, and it was an old movie, probably around the 1920s. I believe it was in Mira Mesa, California, that showed a dirigible or an airship. And most of you are familiar with the Goodyear blimp. But this was a Navy dirigible, and it was about ready to dock at a mast where the point of the dirigible uh, connects with it. But in order to do that, there are guide ropes that help the dirigible to connect. And there are men who guide that dirigible to the guide post. In this particular case, there were two men who were holding on to ropes hanging down from the dirigible. And all of a sudden, a gust of wind blew that dirigible up in the air and taking these two men off the ground up into the air several hundred feet. And one of the men, as, a, as you watch this, it's just shocking on the video, one of the men fell to his death as it went up about three or 400 feet. The other man twisted the rope around himself and hung on for dear life. And about a half an hour later, he was able to be let down to the ground and uh, saved his life. The moral of the story was that he held fast to that rope and saved his life. Let's turn to Revelation, the third chapter. The Bible tells us to hold fast and not let go of spiritual truth. There are many scriptures that urge us to hold fast, to hang on, and to persevere. So will you hang on to the truth and God's way of life to the very end of your life? There are some who have not. There are some who have let go, and they have not held fast. Revelation 3, and of course you know the one verse that we'll look at here in verse 11. This is to the Philadelphia church. Behold, Jesus says, I come quickly or suddenly. Hold that fast which you have that no man take your crown. So Christ tells us to grip tightly, to hold fast. We have a command from Christ to, to do that. So what shall we hold fast to? What are you holding on to? Let's turn to 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 21. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 21. Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Or as the uh, New King James has it, or the NIV, test everything. Hold on to the good. So in the physical life, as some of us get older, our hands are not as, as uh, gripping and strong. I know sometimes that uh, if you have a glass of water, some elderly people like myself might drop that glass of water. Well, I have invented a new system to prevent that. You may not have noticed, but you see my little finger is under the bottom of the glass, so even if my hand is weak, I'm still not going to let that glass of water go. But we do uh, drop things, and uh, we, we realize that circus acrobats have to hold fast. It's been a long time since I've seen a circus, but in the old days, you'd see the trapeze, and they would do somersaults and catch on to the other bar coming from the other end, or actually catch on to hold on to another acrobat. It's going right through the air, and they have to grip one another to keep the other person from falling. I was looking up, uh, just Googled, and of course all of us know how to Google on the internet, and I put in hold fast. And uh, interestingly enough, there is a plant called a bull kelp that grows and thrives in rough and tumble coastal waters. And it's aided by a root-like hold fast. Actually, the root grips onto a rock, and that root is called hold fast. It's a root-like part of the kelp plant that anchors the plant to the rocky seafloor. Uh, sea and it will grow uh, as much as 115 feet long, but that root just grips onto the rock and will not let go. And some of us have gone rock climbing, and we know just uh, how important it is to hold fast and to grip tightly. What should we grip tightly to? We already just saw here in 1 Thessalonians 5.21, we hold fast to that which is good. And what is good, of course, is John 17.17, 17, your word is truth. We see we need to grip onto certain things physically, 
but God tells us to hold fast spiritually. One question we've asked over the years in the telecast and the publications is, what is your authority? What is your foundation? Upon what do you base your beliefs and your whole way of life? Living University, as you know, the foundational word, the principle is, the Word of God is the foundation of knowledge. We heard in the sermonette about the key of knowledge and the key of understanding. Uh, Dr. Wardell mentioned the telecast that I taped this past week, Should Christians Observe the Sabbath? Most of you are familiar with the booklet on which day is the Christian Sabbath. It's a very key point why people keep Sunday rather than keeping the Sabbath. The noted Catholic theologian James Cardinal Gibbons wrote this bold statement, and most of you are familiar with it. You might want to uh, get the Christian Sabbath booklet out again and read it, the many amazing quotes and admissions. James Cardinal Gibbons said, quote, but you may read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and you will not find a single line authorizing the sanctification of Sunday. The scriptures enforce the religious observance of Saturday, a day which we never sanctify. So there's an admission from a Catholic theologian said the scriptures say you ought to keep the Sabbath and we Catholics don't keep the Saturday Sabbath. And that's from Faith of Our Fathers first published in 1876. So in other words Gibbons is saying if the Bible is your foundation, if it's your authority, you have no basis for observing Sunday. The scriptures as he states quote enforce the religious observance of Saturday. And that is what Gibbons and other Catholic authorities state, is that the authority of the Catholic Church is what's changed the observance in the Christian world from Saturday to Sunday, not the New Testament Scriptures. And all that occurred in the Council of Laodicea in the middle of the fourth century. All the true Christians of original Christianity, and uh, Dr. Meredith uh, taped a telecast on that recently, restoring original Christianity. We're probably changing the title of the booklet, Restoring Apostolic Christianity, later on to Restoring Original Christianity. And then there are other admissions from uh, a Baptist minister, Harold Lenzel, who wrote a Battle for the Bible, who is editor of Christianity Today. This is what he said, November 5, 1976, quote, There is nothing in Scripture that requires us to keep Sunday rather than Saturday as a holy day, end of quote. Amazing admissions. And then the statement from the Anglican, Dr. Isaac William, in his Plain Sermons on the Catechism, Volume 1, quote, We are told in Scripture that we are to keep, or where in Scripture are we told that we are to keep the first day at all? Answer, we are commanded to keep the seventh. He says in Scripture we are commanded to keep the seventh but we are nowhere commanded to keep the first day. The reason why we keep the first day of the week holy instead of the seventh is for the same reason that we observe many other things. Not because the Bible, but because the church has enjoined it. It's a fundamental question. What is your authority? Is it the Bible or is it church tradition? These quotes, by the way, I, as I mentioned, are in the Christian Sabbath booklet. I hope you uh, get to read that again sometime soon. So billions of human beings are holding fast, not to the truth, but they're holding fast to false doctrine and false authority. Again, to what should we hold fast? Let's consider seven spiritual treasures or seven spiritual fundamentals that we need to internalize, we need to develop, and we need to hold tightly until we die. Uh, these will, over, will overlap, but to each has a special emphasis. We need to hold fast to these seven essentials. Again, number one, as we saw here in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 21, is hold fast to true values, that which is good. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 21. When we recapture true values, what does that mean? It means that we are recapturing the true values of life, of work, of family relations, of entertainment, 
industry, business, literature, music, the very process of learning to recapture true values is stimulating. And you think about uh, humor, for example. Do you laugh at every joke uh, that you hear, even maybe among church brethren or on television? Or do you filter and you realize, what is this joke about? Is it based on true values or is it based on carnal values? And sometimes it takes me just a microsecond to understand what that basis is. But on the other hand, my wife and I enjoy good humor. It just seems that we can appreciate the irony, the exaggeration, or the incongruity of a situation or story. Uh, we just uh, helps us to love one another more, but we have a special appreciation. Some humor uh, can even effectively illustrate a principle but I hope that you will be on guard to filter and test what this world has to offer, that you're recapturing true values in every way of life. We had a sermon number 408 given by Mr. Crockett titled, Recapture True Values. He emphasized modesty, temperance, and frugality. If you did not hear that sermon, I encourage you to get a copy out of the church library. Are we honoring God in our dress? and our appearance on the Sabbath. We're coming before God, not just before other human beings. Are we setting a good example in our lifestyle? Are we applying God's financial laws in our life? Once you've tested certain principles of life, then you can enjoy life with confidence and with God's blessings. Let's turn back to Proverbs 24. Proverbs 24. Uh, this is a little different approach to recapturing true values. The physical sometimes teaches us spiritual principles. Verse 13 of Proverbs 24. My son, eat you honey because it is good, and the honeycomb which is sweet to your taste. Oh, why should you do that? So shall knowledge of wisdom be unto your soul. When you have found it, then there shall be a reward and your expectation shall not be cut off. Yes, the key of understanding and knowledge is like eating honey and honeycomb. It's been quite some time since I've had honeycomb, but I uh, used to get it along the Connecticut River back in uh, Connecticut and just buy the raw uh, honey with the honeycomb in it. It's just very delicious. Romans 12, 9. Let's uh, look back there. Mary, this number one essential of recapturing true values. Romans, the 12th chapter, and verse 9. Very straightforward admonition. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Now, in the King James uses the word cleave quite often, and the New King James uses the word cling. And we'll see uh, some comments about that later. So we need to cleave to that which is good. And what is it that you have proven in your life is good. It's a principle, a way of life that you live and you practice and you found out that it is true, it's good, it has good reward, it has good fruits, and you live that way of life. And we're constantly recapturing true values in every facet of our lives, or at least we should be. So number one, hold fast to true values. Hold fast to that which you have proven and tested is good. Number two in the essentials of holding fast is hold fast to the words of truth. Turn to Titus, the first chapter. Hold fast to the words of truth. This is going to be a little longer length of the subject here, in this particular section, because there's so much to it that is wonderful and encouraging and inspiring. Titus 1 in verse 9 is telling that an elder must be blameless, a lover of hospitality, uh, verse 9, holding fast what? Holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convict those who contradict. So he says you need to hold fast to the faithful word. Let's turn to 2 Timothy 2, and uh, verse 15, just back a page. Scripture with which you're all familiar. 
study or be diligent. The study is, is not the King James word to actually read a book. It means to be diligent. But still the uh, lesson is clear. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, uh, rightly dividing the word of truth. Or as the NIV has it, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and correctly handles the word of truth. Or the New King James Version, rightly dividing the word of truth. As Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. That's John 8, verse 32. It's one more scripture here before we go on to what words of truth we need to hold fast to. 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, 1 Corinthians 15. Someone just sent me, uh, as uh, often happens uh, in the internet, someone sent me an email with an attached uh, little video by a girl, I think it was from YouTube or whatever, she was reciting the 23rd Psalm. And it was just so cute. Here's this one little girl, she's asking her dad who's videotaping it, surely, surely, and uh, oh, you anoint my head with oil. You know, you, this little girl is going to be holding fast to Psalm 23 in her life. I learned Psalm 23 when I was probably in the eighth grade or so, and I still, uh, when I'm going to sleep at night, uh, I will recite that in my head sometimes if I can't get to sleep and I'll recite Psalm 1 and Psalm 23 and Psalm 100 and Psalm 121 and part of Psalm 133 and then if I can't still get to sleep I'll start <laughs> quoting whatever other scriptures I can remember uh, all the way from Genesis to Revelation. But we have to hold fast and that's what he tells us in 1 Corinthians the 15th chapter verse 1. 1 Corinthians 15, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. And so he says, uh, that's actually in the New King James, in New King James Version, verse 2, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. We need to hold fast to the truth. We need to treasure the truth. So I brought out in the sermon on treasure the truth, that's uh, sermon number 394, of the six and a half billion people on the face of the earth, how many people know the truth? You now if you'd said, well, let's just take a number, 65,000, out of six and a half billion people know the truth, the truth of God, from the Word of God, that is one out of a hundred thousand people. I know some of us feel that we're not important and uh, have a low self-esteem and who am I and so forth. Well, you are important. If God has opened up your mind to understanding the truth, you are one out of a hundred thousand people probably, on the face of the earth who knows God's truth, and you understand it. It's priceless. As it says in the Proverbs, wisdom is more valuable than gold, more valuable than rubies. I love gold and I love rubies, but I, I hope I love wisdom and God's truth that much more. So it's extremely valuable. And I told you the story before when I told my Protestant minister that I was... Uh, leaving the, the, that particular church. And he said, well, why are you leaving the church? And uh, I said, well, when you find the truth, you go after it. And he said, oh, the pearl of great price. And I said, yes. Now, I think God inspired him to say that. I don't think he even knew what he was saying when he said the pearl of great price. But that's what God has given us. He's given all of us the pearl of great price. And there's the treasure in the field, that particular parable, that's Matthew 13, 44, when the man sold all that he had to get that pearl of great price and sold all that he had to get that field in which the treasure lay. Do you understand just how priceless and how valuable the truth is and what we understand? What truths do you treasure? What in your heart and mind? Right now, if I ask you, what is one of the most important truths that you understand, believe, and hold dear to you? What is one of the most important truths 
that is so important and valuable to you? Right now, in your own mind, answer the question. What is important to you? We have a long list. I'm going to spend a little time just listing a few of these truths because sometimes we take them for granted. God has given us the unique privilege, one out of 100,000 people, to understand what we understand. The nature of God, who and what God is. He's the creator. He's the lawgiver. He's the life giver. He's the sustainer. He's the designer. He's the one who fulfills prophecy and answers prayers. He's the eternal who heals. He's the father of lights. He's the father of the family of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is in his name. He is love. 1 John 4, verse 8 and verse 16. We know who and what God is. He is not a trinity. As it is an Elohim, God said, let us make man in our own image after our likeness. God is the father of a family. Our former association wanted to do away with that idea and said God has a family rather than God is a family. No, God is a family and he has a family and he's producing a wonderful family, uh, many of whom are right here. So do we understand that? And we have an article coming up in uh, the next uh, Living Church News, I believe it is, on the three O's. Is that it? Omniscient, omnipresent, and uh, omnipotent. You know, people question, well, is God omnipotent? Is He omnipresent? Is He omniscient? And we have an article coming up on that in the next Living Church News. That's a precious truth. And another priceless truth is the purpose of life. Now, why are you living? And I shared that BC comic strip with you before where the, the caveman is climbing up the mountain and finally gets to the top of the mountain. Here's the guru. And he says, great guru, what is the meaning of life? And the guru says, well, when thou hast con uh, conquered the mountains and when thou hast covered so many hills around the world and so the caveman says, you haven't got the foggiest, have you? <laughs> no, God has given us the truth. We know what the meaning of life is and the purpose of life. It is, I've quoted already, Ephesians 3, 14, that God is the father of a growing family and through his son, Jesus Christ. So God has called us to prepare for his royal family, his kings and his priests. What other truths do you hold valuable? So many people are deceived about an ever-burning hellfire. And I've been at funerals where individuals had the torment of thinking their son, their daughter, or their uh, brother or mother or father was at that moment burning in the torments of hell as an immortal soul. And they were in torment. You don't have to be in torment. You know the truth about the immortal soul. You know the truth about heaven. You know the truth about hell. You know what happens after death. You know about the resurrection. What else do you treasure? God's way of life, John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Matthew 4, 4. I remember years ago when I was renting a a room or an apartment from a, a lady there in Virginia Beach, Virginia, an elderly widow. And she says, uh, where's your church? You, you, I said, well, I, uh, I go to the church on the radio <laughs> because at that time it was the radio church of God. And the nearest congregation for me was about uh, eight or 900 miles away or maybe further in Philadelphia. I was in Virginia Beach at the time working in Norfolk. She says, well, what do you believe? I said, well, I believe that man should live by every word of God, Matthew 4, 4. It was a very simple answer. I still remember that day. But God's way of life is a way of giving, Acts 20, 35. It's a way of sharing. It's a way of caring. It's a way of helping. And maybe you only do that once in a while, and you haven't made it a way of life just as an incidental practice from time to time. But it has to be a way of life. Uh, turn to Romans, the 12th chapter, Romans 12. That whole way of life includes 
being a living sacrifice. As a young boy, I used to think about these heroes who would die for something else. And I thought, well, boy, if I, you know, if I were to sacrifice my life for my friends there in the schoolyard, well, I would sure be a hero. You know, I think I had uh, low self-esteem at that time and thought, well, maybe that would make me important if I could be a hero and die for someone. Well, the, many people have given their lives. But he wants us to be a living sacrifice. Romans 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So we have to be living sacrifices. What else do you treasure that you need to hold on to? God's plan of salvation, as we heard in the sermonette, revealed by the annual festivals and the annual holy days. Even one of our former associates, when they gave up the annual festival, still could not help but hang on to the white throne judgment. And even as a part of an evangelical association had to say, well, maybe there is something to those who really haven't had a op full opportunity for salvation. And he referred to the white throne judgment. Because we keep the Passover, the Days of Unleavened Bread, Pentecost, Trumpets, Atonement, the Feast of Tabernacles, the Last Great Day. What an amazing truth it is. We hold fast to those truths. In Matthew, the 11th chapter, in verse 24, Jesus, he was berating the cities of Chorazin and, and Capernaum because they weren't responding to his preaching. And he said in verse 24 of Matthew 11, I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. What else do you treasure and hold fast to? The understanding of prophecy. Dr. Winnell is bringing out some of the prophetic events that are now rising in Europe and around the world in our regular uh, updates that we uh, give. We have on our latest Tomorrow's World magazine, September-October issue, Dr. O'Neill's cover article, A Resurgent Germany, A Fourth Reich. Why do we understand prophecy? Why do we understand what's going to happen in the future? Because God has revealed to us those keys of understanding the prophecies, the understanding of who and what Israel is, where the United States and Great Britain and the British-descended peoples identified in the scriptures and in the prophecies. The world doesn't know that, and God has given us that opportunity. Turn to John, the 16th chapter, John 16. Yes, hold fast to the words of truth, he tells us. And these are awesome words of truth. And I hope, brethren, that we really deeply appreciate the understanding that God has given to us, that we'll never let go of these truths, that we will hold fast to them. John 16. And verse 13, Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, how do we understand the truth? Well, because God gives us the Spirit of truth. He will guide you into all truth. The world is deceived, it's blinded, it doesn't know better. For he will not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. God gives us an understanding of future events, the prophecies in the Bible. And the gospel is prophetic. It's telling us about the coming kingdom of God that's coming on this earth. Turn to 2 Peter, the first chapter, 2 Peter 1. 2 Peter 1. Again, these are treasures. I hope when you go home today that you will be thanking God for all these wonderful blessings and understanding and precious knowledge and the treasures of truth that He's given us. 2 Peter, the first chapter. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you, verse 2, through the knowledge, and here it's epignosis, meaning full experiential knowledge of God, not just gnosis, meaning knowledge, but epignosis, and of Jesus our Lord, according as His divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness 
through the knowledge of Him that has called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, and I would add the miracle, or I would describe the miracle of divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Though so God has given us great precious promises, all the way from Philippians 4.19, that my God shall provide all your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus, to 1 Corinthians 10.13, that He will not allow us to be tempted or tried above, above that which we are able, but will with that temptation give us a way of escape that we may be able to bear it. So when you're going through these trials and tests, 1 Corinthians 10.13 is a wonderful promise to claim. Let's turn to uh, Hebrews 11.13. Hebrews 11.13. Yes, uh, I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. Thinking I'm not going to get through all seven of these. And you may be right. <clears throat> we may have to go to part two later on. Uh, Hebrews 11, verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, as it is in the King James, or welcomed them, as it is in other translations, they embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. So we treasure the promises of God. We welcome the promises of God. We embrace them, just as Abraham and Isaac and Jacob did. And they saw a city that God was producing, a heavenly city, which we talked about in the Sermon on Jerusalem. We can read the following scriptures. Mr. Herbert Armstrong wrote a book called The Mystery of the Ages, The Seven Mysteries. Again, these are fundamental, eye-opening truths that we appreciate and should appreciate deeply. The seven mysteries were number one, who and what is God? We've been discussing that. Number two is the mystery of angels and evil spirits. Uh, number three, the mystery of man. Four, the mystery of civilization. You know, who started the civilization? What about Babylon? Nimrod started that great city called Babel, uh, Babel or Babel. And then number five of the truths that we understand, the mystery of Israel. Number six, the mystery of the church. And here we're warned, of course, in Hebrews 10, 24, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Uh, Mr. Uh, Amon gave a sermon out on that last week up in uh, Statesville. And I might just mention along that line, we're talking about the church, Proverbs 18.1. I won't turn there. But it says, a man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. He rages against all wise judgment. And when we see all the splits from the church of God, we understand that some will not allow themselves to be tested. We have a multitude of counsel. And when any one of us seems to get a little off track, the others put us right back to the trunk of the tree truths and wise doctrine and judgment. Don't isolate yourself and don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together, as it says the manner of some is there in uh, Hebrews, the uh, 10th chapter. So number six is the mystery of the church. Number seven, the mystery of the kingdom of God. So as we read in Titus 1, and verse 9, brethren, let's hold fast the faithful word as we have been taught. So number, number two of the essentials to holding fast is hold fast to the truth. John 17, 17, your word is truth. Hold fast to the words of truth. Number three, again, these overlap somewhat, is to hold fast to your true biblical faith. That is the body of doctrine, the teaching. So, well, this is similar to number two. But let's uh, turn to Hebrews, the fourth chapter. Hebrews 4 and verse 14. Hebrews 4, verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, or in the New King James Version, let us hold fast our confession. What's, what confession? Is it confession of sin? 
No, it's a confession of faith. What body of faith do you hold on to? What body of faith do you believe? We've expressed that faith in our statement of beliefs, the statement of fundamental beliefs. If any of you do not have a copy of that, be sure to contact our office here and, and request a copy of the statement of fundamental beliefs. Let's turn to uh, 1 Timothy, the third chapter, 1 Timothy 3. So it tells us in the NIV, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let, let us hold firmly to the faith we possess. 1 Timothy, the uh, third chapter, starting with uh, verse 8. <clears throat> Likewise must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre or, or money. Holding, what are we going to hold fast to? Holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. Let's turn to Jude uh, 3. So we hold firmly to the mystery of the faith. Of course, as it says in Colossians 1.21, that the mystery of the gospel is Christ in you, the hope of glory. You know Jude. Uh, Jude was going to write a general letter about the common salvation. And this was kind of an emergency letter that he wrote. He said, it became needful for me to write unto you, verse 3, and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints or in the New King James Version, that was once for all delivered to the saints. So, brethren, let's review our statement of fundamental beliefs. And again, if you don't have a copy, please request it. Number three is hold fast to the true biblical faith, the body of doctrine that was once for all delivered to the saints. Turn back to Revelation 3 and uh, verse 10 again. <clears throat> well, we didn't read verse 10. We just read verse 11 before. You may have read verse 10. All right. Revelation 3, verse 10. Because you have kept my command to persevere, or in the King James, kept the word of my patience, I will also keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. This is a command to persevere. And in that very context, he says, Behold, I am come quickly. Hold fast that you have, that no one may take your crown. So not only do you hold fast to recapturing true values, hold fast to true words, hold fast to the body of belief, but you also make a commitment to endure to the end. You keep Christ's command to persevere. That is, you've made a commitment to endure to the end. Some of you may not have made that commitment. I gave a sermon uh, this last March on seven Passover commitments. One of the commitments that every one of us needs to make, if we haven't yet, is that we will be faithful until the day we die. We will hold on to the truth till the day we die. We will persevere, as it says in Matthew 24, 13. He that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. Then he goes on to say in verse 12, He that overcomes will make a pillar in the temple of my God. So have you made a persevering commitment, a commitment to persevere? Are you deeply committed to endure to the end? Will you die in the faith? Over the past several years, we've had dozens of ministers and brethren who have died in the faith. And can there be a more complimentary statement, a more encouraging statement about a person's life, other than that he or she has died in the faith? I hope you've made that commitment to endure to the end. There are many physical analogies. Uh, Hebrews, the 12th chapter, uh, gives one of those, one of my favorite scriptures, Hebrews 12 and verse 1. 
This is about running a race. I know back in 1969, Kenneth Cooper's book had just come out the previous year on aerobics. Aerobics means with oxygen, and he had tested many Air Force cadets and found that the key of health was the ability of the heart to produce, to pump blood and oxygen through the body. And that was a key to in health, the enduring health. And so <clears throat> we as faculty members started uh, going that summer of uh, 1969. I think there were about 15 of us that went jogging 1.8 miles four days a week and 3.1 miles two days a week. And the end of about six weeks or so, I felt the best I had ever felt my whole life, even uh, having gone through basic training in the Army. I still felt much healthier and more alert and energetic. Uh, some of you may have uh, read here, of course he says, Wherefore, seeing you have a, we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, with endurance. When you're running a race, you just keep at it. You keep at it with a regular rhythm, regular pace, but you have a goal, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So he looked forward. And we have to run that race, it's a spiritual race, with patience. You may have read uh, just a couple days ago about this eight-year-old girl in China who ran uh, 2,212 miles. It says headline here from uh, Arizona Daily Star, the Associated Press is picked up by many of the uh, news wires. Father of Chinese eight-year-old denies abuse allegations after she runs more than 2,000 miles. Beijing, an 18-year-old girl ran more than a marathon and a half each day for nearly two months jogging 2,212 miles to Beijing, followed by her bicycle riding father, who denied Tuesday that he had forced her. Zhang Jiamin said his daughter, Huey Min, made the trip as a show of support for the 2008 Beijing Summer Olympics and considered pounding the pavement a form of play. You can force your child one day, but you can't force one to wake up early in the morning every day if one doesn't want to. He was quoted as saying in the China Daily newspaper, <coughs> excuse me, I never impose my will on her, for the girl running is more about jumping and playing rather than a chore, the paper quoted Zhang as saying. So this eight-year-old reached Beijing on Sunday after running from her home on the southern island province of Hainan. Her father, a distance runner in his youth, followed her on an electric bicycle. She, uh, 44 pounds, four feet tall, ran an average of 40 miles a day for 55 days in a row. It's uh, maybe going to take uh, some health uh, penalties in her body, perhaps. <clears throat> but uh, talk about perseverance and endurance. There was someone, however, in the Bible who didn't endure to the end, didn't hold fast. I mentioned uh, in the sermon on how to please God, the example of King Solomon. Turn back to 1 Kings, the third chapter. What pleased God about King Solomon was that when he gave his prayer, when God offered him, well, Solomon, ask what you will. And Solomon gave a speech that said that he wanted an understanding heart, 1 Kings 3 and uh, verse 5, 1 Kings 3 and verse 5. And because Sam, because uh, Solomon asked not for riches and for glory, but for wisdom and judgment, it is 1 Kings 3 and uh, verse uh, 11, God said unto him, because you have asked this thing and have not asked for yourself long life, riches and life of your enemies, but for understanding to discern judgment, that I am given you a wise and understanding heart. Notice verse 10. And the speech pleased the Eternal that Solomon had, Solomon had asked this thing. But now turn to 1 Kings, the 11th chapter. Did Solomon hold fast to the end, even though God gave him this spiritual discernment, gave him the gift of judgment? What happened to Solomon? 
1 Kings 11 and verse 3. And he had 700 wives, princes, and 300 concubines, or as the little children said, he had 700 wives and 300 porcupines. <coughs> Nonetheless, the key of it is here that his wives, the end of verse 3, his wives turned away his heart. In the next verse, his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect or not loyal with the eternal his God, as was the heart of David his father. He did not endure to the end. He compromised, and I hope, brethren, that we do not compromise. Uh, Dr. Meredith, in uh, the March-April 2005 Tomorrow's World Personal, wrote an article titled, Are You a Compromiser? You know, we realize most of us have been tested. Maybe it's been on the job for keeping the Sabbath, and our employer said, look, you got to come in tonight, five, uh, uh, at uh, 7 o'clock tonight, Friday night, if you want to keep your job, and, and some of our brethren have compromised. Others of us have not. We lost our jobs, and God tested us. And we passed that test. But we have to be determined and committed that we will not compromise. As Dr. Meredith wrote in that article, Quote, certainly one may compromise about which restaurant to visit or which ball game to attend. It can be good to be agreeable and let, let others decide in ordinary human situation. But when it comes to God's law, obedience to the very creator of heaven and earth, you and I must truly learn to fear watering down or compromising God's truth in the way we live or teach. So we have to hold on to the true values and to the body of truth. Turn back to uh, Proverbs, the fifth chapter. Though so uh, King S Solomon did not endure to the end, he compromised. Are you committed? Are you going to hold fast to the end? Proverbs 5 and verse 5. Again, here is a contrasting view, a negative view of holding on, what not to hold on. Here it's talking about the uh, strange woman who is alluring the uh, unsuspected simpleton. Verse 4 of Proverbs 5, But her end is bitter as a wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death, and her steps take hold on hell, or her steps lay hold of hell. What are you going to hold fast to, the false values or the true values? Again, I won't turn there, but I'll just give you the reference, Ecclesiastes 2.3, how Solomon said he searched for the ways of life and how to lay hold on folly. He actually experimented by laying hold on folly to see what the fruit of that was, till I might see what was good for the sons of men to do under heaven all the days of their lives. But they did not endure because they did lay hands on folly eventually, and he was distracted by his wives. But he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. So number four of the essentials to holding fast is hold fast to a persevering commitment, the commitment to persevere. Turn to uh, Hebrews, the sixth, uh, third chapter. Hebrews 3, number 5 is to hold fast to hope and lay hold of hope. We've had sermons, several sermons over the years on hope. Hebrews, the third chapter. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence of and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. <clears throat> Remember, we just saw in Hebrews, the 12th chapter, that Jesus looked ahead to the glory that he had before the world was. He saw that he was going to be seated next to God the Father. And so while he went through the crucifixion, he had the vision of the future. Now, hope is an expectation. The difference between faith and hope is that faith is an assurance and a conviction. Hope is an expectation. You know, young ladies uh, used to have 
what they call a hope chest years ago. Uh, they would start collecting items for their wedding, their future wedding. They expected to get married, and they were, again, accumula accumulating items for their wedding. That was called a hope chest. They were expecting something in the future. So we have to expect the coming kingdom of God, and we're going to lay hold of that vision. The uh, World Ahead last week, the commentary by Dr. Winnale that was in the World Ahead was called The Value of Hope. I hope, uh, I hope you read that. <laughs> He's, he writes, having a hope in the future, something positive to look forward to, is a vital aspect of life. We have everything to look forward to. He said, are we all motivated by the same hope today? I hope you read the value of hope here. We have to lay hold on hope. As he says in Hebrews 3, verse 6, if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. Hebrews 10 and uh, verse 23, Hebrews 10 and verse 23. There are several of these, but I'll just read this one. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith or confession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Or in the New King James Version, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who is promised is faithful. The, uh, we need that vision, as I already pointed out in Hebrews 11, verse 9, that we look forward to a time of a new kingdom, of world peace, and Christ comes back and we're a part of his family forever. The capital of the world is, is Jerusalem. So we look forward to that time when we will inherit all things. Let's turn to Romans, the eighth chapter, as part of our hope that we are looking forward to, and it's an assurance as well as an expectation. Romans 8 and verse 32. Very special verse. I um, hope you will mark it. I expect that you will mark it. He that spared not his own son. Romans 8, 32. This is the Holy Spirit chapter. Just very, very inspiring and encouraging. Whenever you feel down, you want to read through this chapter. He that spared not his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? He's demonstrated his love by sacrificing his son so that we would be forgiven of all of our sins. And if, if he's done that, how much more is he going to give us an inheritance? He says back across the page, verse 17, that we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. What are we going to inherit? We're going to inherit the earth. The meek shall inherit the earth. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, but we will inherit the kingdom of God. We inherit eternal life. We inherit all things. And the Greek here in this verse, verse 32, is ta panta. It means literally the all. T-A is the definite article, the. And panta is all. And you look it up in any of the lexicons, and what it means is the all is everything seen and unseen. The total universe that we can see and the spiritual world that we cannot see. God is giving us all things. And what a tremendous blessing that is. That is the hope to which we must hold fast. And when we think about the galaxies out there, which, which I've included in a, will include. Mr. Baca can get the, uh, the various graphics for telecast 317, the end of the universe, which we taped just a month ago. The Hubble telescope has brought incredible views of galaxies. I have a screensaver on my home computer, and it just has these one galaxy after another. Uh, <clears throat> there's the Cartwheel galaxy that's 500 million light years away. There's the Cygnus Loop Supernova Remnant. There's the Crab Nebula, the Trifid Nebula, the Tadpole Galaxy, because it looks like a tadpole, the Cone Nebula, the Swan Nebula, the uh, M51 Whirlpool Galaxy. Oh, that is just beautiful. I, I wouldn't mind uh, having that. <clears throat> 
The uh, Eagle Nebula, M16, is only 7,000 light years away, and the Lagoon Nebula is only 5,000 light years away. So I hope you've seen the, uh, actually if you just get on hubblesite.org, uh, you can see some of these galaxies, just incredible views, hubblesite.org, S-I-T-E for site. So what do we hold fast to? We lay hold to the hope that is set before us. That we have here in Romans 8 chapter, he's going to freely give us all things. So number five is hold fast to hope or lay hold of hope as it tells us in the scriptures, and exercise vision. For number six, turn to Jeremiah 13 and verse 11. Jeremiah 13 and verse 11. This is uh, a little graphic in one way, although the New King James Version gives a different graphic picture. Jeremiah, the 13th chapter, Remembers a type of Jeremiah's linen girdle, which he was told to bury and to see what would happen to it. And uh, so he's giving a message to his people. In verse 10 of Jeremiah 13, he says, This evil people which refuse to hear my words, which walk in the imagination of their heart and walk after other gods to serve them and to worship them, shall even be as this girdle, which is good for nothing. Verse 11, I'm reading the King James Version here. For as the girdle cleaves to the loins of a man, so have I caused to cleave unto me the whole house of Israel and the whole house of Judah, says the Eternal, that they might be unto me for a people and for a name and for a praise and for a glory, but they would not hear. What an incredible relationship. That is rather a tight intimate relationship. New King James has it, for as the sash clings to the waist of a man. So in this way you can visualize a belt around someone's waist. So have I caused the whole house of Israel and the whole, whole house of Judah to cling to me. So God says to, the, to us, we need to cling to him. We need to cleave to him. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians, the sixth chapter. 1 Corinthians 6, and uh, I don't know if you've thought of yourself as cleaving to or clinging to a God or to Christ. He brings the negative illustration here about a harlot in 1 Corinthians, the sixth chapter, in verse 16, he says, What know you not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body, for two, says he, shall be one flesh. But notice this, and I hope this is your spiritual situation, but he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. You cling to the Lord, you cleave to the Lord. You're like a belt around his waist, and you are one spirit with Christ. Are you one spirit with Christ? Remember, the physical analogy is uh, Mark 10 and verse 7, which he refers to here, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. So I cleave to my wife. And of course, you wives, I hope you let your husbands cleave to you. That's an important part of it too. Let's turn to Isaiah, the 64th chapter. Isaiah 64. Remember, Daniel had a prayer of confession. Here, Isaiah as a prayer of confession in Isaiah the 64th chapter, Isaiah 64. So do you cleave to God as a sash around his waist? Isaiah 64 and verse 6. So he's confessing his sins and he's saying, but we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Sometimes we have to take a look at our own righteousness and see, well, really, is it God's righteousness or is it self-righteousness? And we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. And there is none that calls upon your name that stirs up himself to take hold of you. For you have hid your face from us and have consumed us because of our iniquities. 
But now, O Eternal, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you our potter, and we all are the work of your hand. He says, none stirs himself up to take hold of him. Brethren, we do need to do that, and I hope we continually do it. And if we've been away from God, we stir ourselves up to take hold of God. There's a very dramatic example of that in Genesis, the 32nd chapter. I'll turn back there, Genesis 32, where Jacob literally wrestled with the Eternal, with the Lord. In Genesis 32, you know, as a director of admissions for 10 years at Ambassador College, uh, we always, uh, if any of the men put on there that they were wrestlers, we knew uh, they have a pretty good character because a wrestler really has to have tenacity. He has to really hold on. And uh, that's one of the more grueling sports. So here in Genesis, the 32nd chapter, verse 24, Jacob had sent his family across the brook uh, intending to meet Esau. But he was left alone, verse 24, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched, that is, the eternal, <clears throat> as you see later, because he said, I have seen God face to face, verse 30. So it's uh, very clear with whom Jacob was wrestling. And he said, um, and when he saw that he prevailed not against him, the eternal touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he, meaning the eternal, said, let me go for the day breaks. And Jacob said, I will not let you go except you bless me. That's a pretty bold statement. And yet, the one who was the eternal blessed him and changed his name. He said, your name is now Israel because as a prince, you have power with God and with men and have prevailed, verse 24. So have you ever wrestled with God? I gave that as one of the ten strategies of effective prayer uh, years ago in sermon number 35. One of the strategies of prayer is to wrestle with God. And I remember one time years ago when I received a call for an anointing and uh, a young lady who was the wife of one of our ambassador students, was trying to give birth, but it was a breech birth, and it was backwards, and uh, it couldn't, uh, it couldn't come out. And so I went over and, and prayed for her, and uh, it would have been a real problem for the church and the college, because the particular family had not um, checked with the proper uh, medical authorities, or even with the certified midwives, and this, as I recall. And I said, I went back after anointing uh, that woman. I went back and I said, Father, I'm going to wrestle with you for an hour. I'm going to pray an hour and really for this situation and give you all the reasons why you need to intervene. You need to intervene not only for the baby, not only for the mother, but you need to intervene for your church. You need to intervene for your college. And I wrestled with God for a full hour in that prayer. And I called, called the woman, the, the husband's wife. He said, well, Mr. Ames, she said, uh, 15 minutes after you left, the baby was born. So I wrestled with God another 45 minutes unknowingly <laughs> after the baby was born. But we do have to get hold of God. He does say, none stirs himself to take hold of me. Number six, the sixth essential to which we must hold fast is cling to God. Hold fast to God. Draw near to God, as it says in James 4, verse 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Number seven is to hold fast to eternal life, or as it has it in the scriptures, lay hold on eternal life. 1 Timothy, the sixth chapter. 1 Timothy 6. Now, God has given us something special. It's a life on the God plane, as after we're born, of course, into his family, uh, to live with glorious, immortalized brothers and sisters and sons of God as kings and priests of his royal family forever. And he's offering that gift to us, that promise to us. And we have to hold, lay hold on eternal life. First Timothy 6 
in verse 12. He tells Timothy here, the Apostle Paul writes, Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto you are also called and have professed a good profession before many witnesses. And then down in verse 17, he says, uh, Command those in the New King James, um, Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who gives us richly all things to enjoy, as we read back in 2 Peter 1 and verse 4, that he gives us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Let them do good. Let them be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share. Number 19, verse 19, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. Number seven is hold fast to eternal life. As it tells us in Colossians 3, 4, when Christ, who is our life, shall return. Then shall we appear with him in glory. Lay hold on eternal life. God has called us to be his royal family, to become his children. He's revealed to us incredible understanding, precious truths, incredible understanding. And yet some have neglected those gifts. They've neglected the salvation that God promises us. And so we need to take a warning as well. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 12. I already quoted verse 13 as one of God's promises. 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, and verse 12. Wherefore, let him that thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Hey, Mr. Parting has given these uh, admi admonitions on never say never or never say always. <laughs> and, uh, like those people who said, I never would leave the church. And, those are the ones who inevitably do, or some have at least, because you can't say, I can do it on my own. You know, God willing, I will never leave the church. I'm committed to endure to the end. I've made that commitment with my whole life. So he says, take heed lest you fall. There is no temptation or trial taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. We have to be faithful to him. He is faithful, who will not permit you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also may make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So we need to take that warning and heed that warning. Revelation, the uh, second chapter. Not only did uh, Jesus tell the Philadelphia church to hold fast, but he also told other churches to hold fast as well. For example, uh, verse uh, 25, Thyatira, he said, uh, Revelation 2, verse 25, but that which you have already hold fast till I come, and he that overcomes and keeps my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And then Revelation 3 and uh, verse 3, Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard and hold fast, he says to the Sardis church, and repent. If therefore you shall not watch, I will come on you as a thief, and you shall not know what hour I will come unto you. And so in verse 11, he again tells us, Behold, I come quickly or suddenly. Hold that fast which you have, that no man take your crown. Brethren, we need to hold fast to God's spiritual treasures, the spiritual fundamentals. We need to internalize them. We do need to develop them. We need to hold, hold tightly to them until the day we die. We need to hold fast to these seven spiritual essentials. Number one was hold fast to true values. Hold fast to that which you have proven and tested is good. Number two was hold fast to the words of truth. Treasure the truth. Hold fast to the truth. Number three was hold fast to your true biblical faith, the body of doctrine or teaching. Number four, hold fast to a persevering commitment, the commitment to persevere. Number five was hold fast to hope, exercise vision. Number six, hold fast to God, cling to God, stir yourself up to take hold of Him, as Isaiah said. Number seven, hold fast to eternal life, lay hold on eternal life. 
I asked my wife uh, when I first started thinking about this subject, I said, "Hun, what should we hold fast to? And she immediately said, the truth, God, to Christ, the true church, and the work. And then later she added the basics. So brethren, let's stir ourselves up to take hold of our Father, Father in heaven. Let's stir ourselves up to take hold of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's hold fast to the truth and never let go.